very brief. It's not a long chapter, uh, but we go from Acts one to I try. I, I want to kind of you know touch on Acts. I try to cover it as much as I can every year because it's a crucial book. Uh, it's a book of history. It's a book of adventure and excitement. It has all kind of stuff, and yet it also has all kind of hidden messages within Acts to show you things that you can apply to yourself spiritually. Uh, that the Lord will want to have us to grow as a Christian. So before we do that, let's open up, of course, always. All right. Now, of course, the book of Acts is a book of history. Um, and this is what I love so much about it. A lot of people say, well, am I in the right church? What kind of church should I go to? Well, the first thing you want to do is see how was the church in the beginning? How did it operate? And if your church has deviated from the way that the church operated, then you're probably in the wrong type of church. So the only way you could know how the church operated was to read the historical documentation of how the church functioned, what happened, what things took place, what did the apostles teach the church, and so on and so forth. The book of Acts was written by Luke, the physician. He wrote the book of Acts, and he followed probably Peter and Paul around just simply documenting the things that he saw and heard. So he was also a historian. He took details and facts and created this beautiful adventure. If I could take several pieces of the Bible and make a movie out of it, one would be David's life, because I got to put him on screen killing the life. Man, that got to be one of the best scenes in the Bible. Two would probably be Samson. I, I think that would be pretty tough. When the man killed hundreds of guys by himself, I would love to recreate that. But three would be the book of Acts, because it's built around all types of excitement and adventure. The church was on fire. It wasn't like it is nowadays where it's stagnant and people are cool, calm, and collective, and we go into the nice big buildings and we sit in our nice comfortable seats and we enjoy our service on Sunday. These guys were hostile against the devil. They went out and they were saving souls and they were working miracles and they suffered persecution. I'm talking serious type of persecution that we are not faced with in America today, but in some countries they are. So here we go. It says, the former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. So he starts off by letting us know that this, these are the things that Jesus did and taught. Until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. So he documents all this he did up until the time that he actually was ascended and he gave the apostles commandments to go forth and do these things. Now, a lot of people will say, okay, well, uh, we don't believe in the apostles' doctrine. Okay, meaning the stuff that the apostles taught the church. But I don't understand how they cannot believe in the apostles' doctrine, who the apostles were guided by. They wrote these things as Jesus gave them the words to write. Jesus inspired, or the Holy Spirit inspired these writings. So they weren't just up there freestyling. They weren't just up there coming up with stuff out of their own mind and imagination. So if you don't believe what the apostles wrote in the Bible, you basically don't believe what Jesus did and said, because he gave them the words to write. So we understand that the apostles wrote and documented these things as they were led by the Holy Spirit. Verse 3, to whom also he shewed himself alive uh, after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now, this is what I love about the book of Acts because it breaks that down. It says, he showed himself alive after his passion to many infallible proofs. Now, this is the base and sum of our religion. As a Christian, if we do not believe that Jesus Christ died and what rose, then Christianity is dead. We might as well pack up the Bible, throw it away, go out, have some drinks and kick it. Party like a rock star until the end, of the, the end of the world comes. However, when it says Jesus showed himself to people after he died, and he made sure that it was with infallible proofs, he made sure everyone who saw him didn't say, well, I thought it was him. I, it looked like Jesus. Gonna... He made sure it was up close and personal so they could say, no, that's Jesus. In fact, he did it for days. How many days did he do it? Was it? 40 days. 40 days. So he didn't just rise and make a quick cameo appearance one day and be like, I'm out. He rolled on the scene after rising and stayed around for 40 days so nobody could mistake whether he had really rose from the grave or not. And this took place after his passion. Now the word passion means what? His suffering. After he died and on the cross, 
That was considered the passion of Christ. We saw the movie, The Passion of Christ. Basically what that is, is the suffering of Christ. It highlights an idealization of his suffering. Almost does it a disservice. It downplays it because when it talks about the passion of Christ, it just says that they crucified him. They drove a, 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 a sword through his side. Or they nailed nails into his hands. And they really don't get into the breakdown of what he went through. First, psychologically. Imagine if tomorrow you were going to be crucified. Or tomorrow you were going to get the electric chair. You wouldn't be up in here tonight cooling. You, you know what cracks me up? They got the nerve when you're about to get the electric chair to give you a last meal. Who can eat when you're about to get electrocuted? <laughs> like, yeah, what you want to eat? I'd be like, nothing! I'm about to throw it all up <laughs> as soon as you fry me. I don't want no steak, no fish, no hamburger ass. You hear that offering me grub about to fry me. You know, and so the passion creates anxiety. It is not something that Jesus went through just cool. Like, oh, it's time to die. Bad. Let's do it. I mean, this was psychologically damaging to the point where he was bleeding from his pores because he was under such stress. It said that blood dripped from his pores as he went under stress, knowing that he was going to be crucified. Now, I've had some procedures done in the hospital. You know, I don't technically really like getting stuck with a needle. That ain't, that's got, that ain't something about that message with me. You know, I can suck it up. I'm a man. I take it and look at it while I'm doing it. Yeah, that's right. Ah, yeah, come on. But if I could pass, I would. I don't want to get stuck with a needle. So imagine you knowing that you're going to get nails drove through your wrists and through your feet. And not only that, before that, you're going to get beat beyond measure. They didn't just beat him because the rule was you were only supposed to give, I think, 39 stripes. You're not supposed to go beyond that. Because then they, quote, unquote, call that excessive punishment for the, the criminal. However, they beat him way beyond that. They beat his whole body to where none of his body was exposed. Who can even take 39? I mean, I'm a tough cat. But, I, I mean, with a big, fat whip, 39 shots, I don't know. That'll bring the girl out of me. I mean, I'm like... <laughs> it had me. Hit me with the alcohol in the back here. There you go. Clean you up. You know? But that's, <laughs> that right there in itself creates... Anxiety in my mind. Just anticipating getting beat, but not just 39 strikes. You talking face, body, chest, legs, everything. They beat him to the point where history says you can see his bowels through his ribs. That means they ripped open his side where you can see his bowel exposed. This was a brutal, long beating that he took. Not only that, afterwards, they throw a nasty, dirty board on his shoulders, on top of his open wounds, and have him walk a quarter of a mile or so uphill to be crucified. So this right here really does it a disservice when it just says the passion or he was crucified. We understand when you see it in its reality, if you study the physics of being crucified, you sitting back struggling the whole time to stay alive because of your body weight dropping down, it caused the nails to rip through the tendons in your feet. And then you push up because your arms are laying down like this. You want to relieve your feet. Now all of a sudden it extends your chest and the nail is ripping through the tendons here. So now you push up again and it pulls through the feet. And then when that hurts too much, you relax. And then it pulls through the hands. And this ongoing struggle continues until you are exhausted. And then you can't really take a deep breath because your arms are extended. And after a while, what happens is you suffocate on your own carbon dioxide in your lungs. And this is a process that goes on for hours and hours. Thank God the Lord just died shortly after he was uh, crucified. So, it says, they showed himself to all these people, all right, um, with infallible proofs, being seen with them 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So now his whole goal was to tell them about a new kingdom, not this worldly kingdom. And this is why they rejected him, because they wanted a king to come on the scene and preach and teach about a worldly kingdom. Right now, we're looking for Obama for the solution to all the world's problems. We are mistaken. It just isn't going to happen. I hate to tell you all that. I know we had big hopes and dreams, but not much has changed since he's been in office. I think we thought as soon as we step on the scene, we were going to be enjoying chocolate, and we were going to be enjoying new cars and health care and all that stuff. It takes time, if ever, the things for things to get better. And most likely, they won't. So if we're sitting back putting our faith in this world, we are sadly mistaken. In fact, it says in this world you shall have trouble. This ain't the world that we want to live in because it's trouble. It ain't no big playground. We have pockets of fun and happiness here and there. But for the most part, we spend most of our lives dealing with issues and problems. We spend most of our lives figuring out how am I going to pay the rent? 
How am I going to make it to my next paycheck? How am I going to get something to eat? How am I going to... And it's problem after problem after problem. And it's designed that way to let us know that this isn't the kingdom that we should be looking at. The kingdom that we should be looking at is the heavenly kingdom. And so this is why they hated Jesus, because he wasn't talking about how to make their pockets fat. He wasn't talking about how they could live in big mansions down here and eat grapes and have all the women. He was talking about what happens to you after you take your last breath on earth. And they like, hey, we don't want right now, I'm enjoying here. And so they killed him, and he is preaching in a heavenly kingdom. Now, going on, what verse am I at? Four? It says, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which said he, ye have heard of me. Now, what is he talking about? After he brought it down to the apostles, he says, listen, don't do nothing yet. I'm giving you all these commandments, but I want you to go to Jerusalem and sit there and wait until the Comforter comes. Now, what is the Comforter? It is the Holy Spirit. It is Jesus Christ now coming in spirit form into the believer. It is him distributing himself to individuals so that we can all have a part of Jesus in us. And he says, don't do nothing because the Holy Spirit will guide you. It will give you understanding. It will give you revelations. It will be me inside of you on the wheels of steel, scratching and mixing and cutting it up. It will be me inside of you giving you the words to say, giving you the understanding of the Bible, all of these things. So he tells them to wait in, uh, uh, in Jerusalem for the promise the Father uh, is going to give. And it says, for John truly baptized with water, but you should be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So he tells them that John Baptist, we all remember him. This was the dude in the wilderness out there with the long knotty dreadlocks out there just preaching, telling everybody <laughs> that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This was the hardcore prophet that didn't do nothing but walk around with camel coats on and eating locusts and honey. Now that's a diet for you. Try that one. Man, most of us can't even do a Daniel diet. Take meat away, we'll have a fit. Man, I, right now I want some meat, right now. As I'm speaking, I'm thinking about chicken. So <laughs> my point is, we are carnivores. We love good delicacies and food. You back to eating yogurt or whatever that is, or ice cream. I want to just walk right down over these steps right now and just come and get some of that. Because we like to consume. So imagine if you was in a 